Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, first, let me introduce Roy Galuli Darnell, uh, the data scientist team lead um, at Perception Point. Roy develops algorithms to, can, to counter cyber attacks using state of the art machine learning. Previously, he worked at Anadoc's Gen Z Lab and Solar Edge. He also founded his own startup that focused on the automation of biological and medical research. He earned a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science and Biology from Tel Aviv University and was a captain in the Israeli Air Force, leading sensitive and complex operations. I'm Sophie, Perception Points Marketing Coordinator, and I'll be your moderator. But first, a few housekeeping items uh, before we begin. It's important to note that this webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be available to you at the end of the webinar. Have any questions throughout the duration of the webinar? Uh, awesome. We actively encourage discussion throughout the webinar. Please check the bottom of your screen. There's a button for Q&A and &A you can enter your questions and we will do our best to answer. If we don't, uh, we will have some follow-up here. In today's webinar, we'll be talking about the role of AI in cybercrime and cyber defense. The cyber threat landscape is rapidly expanding as cyber criminals discover new techniques to brief organizations. One of the new methods that has emerged is the use of artificial intelligence to scale and effectiveness of socially engineered attacks. Cyber criminals employ AI to help convince and trick people into believing that a video, phone call, or email is legitimate in order to compromise networks and access sensitive data. Okay, without further ado, I'm passing it over to you, Roy. Thank you, Sophie. Um, okay, guys, so just like Sophie said, um, I'm the data science team lead at Perception Point. And today I'll give you some insights about um, how we do things here and the way we see things. And um, this uh, lecture doesn't require any um, knowledge, prior knowledge. So if you don't understand anything, uh, it's my fault. So feel free to ask and I will do my best to answer. Um, yeah, feel free to stop me if you want me to elaborate on something. Uh, just let's try to make it a conversation and not just um me talking so um yeah uh let's get into it so um i'm suggesting it's really easy to attack in the cyberspace and this is my example hey can you send me your password please and i don't know if you're giggling or not but let's say uh we think about this from a statistic point of view Let's say I send it to a billion people. Um, there is some percentage of these people who are right now actually expecting someone uh, to ask them their password, and maybe they will think it's you who sent it to them, and maybe they'll respond. So if we're looking at big numbers, there is always the possibility that um, you, you're spot on. Like someone is expecting or is like um, you can exploit someone's weakness even without directing it. Now, of course, this is um, very difficult to do. It's a very difficult task to send uh, unique messages to 10 billion people, but just consider this, that even the simplest of like messages could be an actual attack if you send to enough people or at the right scale. Um, so to make it a little bit more realistic, where I'm going to show you how easy it is to create an actual campaign, uh, attack campaign, um, just so we can see um, what are the principal uh, parts of an attack. And um, yeah, and then we'll start breaking it down to how we can defend against it. And like the cat and mouse chase of um, new developments in the cyberspace. So let me walk you through uh, the video we're gonna see and I'm gonna explain it during, but uh, just so we get an overview. So first thing is getting a mail template. What we're going to see is a cyber attack using email. And the first stage is to have an email template. And uh, we're not going to create an email ourselves. We're going to generate it automatically using a tool. Then we're going to build a website, which is a phishing website. It's not an actual website. It's a website which is designed solely to steal your credentials uh, and again this is a template you don't have to write any code 
it's a different tool and we're going to use that tool in order to create the website um, then we have a few more settings to set which are for example who are we going to send it to what do we want to do with the uh, stolen credentials etc and finally we need to launch our campaign now after we've done that we'll change perspective and we'll move to the victim's point of view and we'll see what it looks like from their perspective um yeah so what i want you to notice is that although some things might look complicated um, none of them involves code they are all tools you can download and you need some knowledge as to how to use them but you don't need to be an actual coder so all you have to do is know how to run some tools uh, which are not that difficult uh, so let's see what it looks like um right so first we have some settings to run um these settings are nothing special they're just like uh, an email account uh, you've set up somewhere um, and this is our victim and let's say we somehow obtained that victim's email maybe we scrape it from their website maybe we bought it on the dark web um, maybe we're guessing it and this is just testing from um, our tool to see if the tool manages to send emails and it does and now what we want to do is create a template so now we're adding a template we're generating a template using uh, zfisher which is a tool and this template is what we're gonna send to our victim so in this uh, example we're creating a gmail template and the target email because we want it customized and now we have it generated And this is what it looks like. Now, let's stop here for a second. I'm guessing you've seen this type of um, screen. This is not an actual Google screen. This is the screen template that was created. If you take a look, it has the name of the person we're trying to attack, which is now testing. And um, this is our actual attack. This is what the attack looks like. It's not a defense mechanism. We are attacking and we're imitating as if we are Google and we have blocked an attack. So this is like a, an attack using a, a, like a blocked attack as the a template. And this is not like an actual Google website. And now he's just paste, copy pasting the template. And this is also pretty interesting. So how do you customize uh, the same template to a lot of people? So all you have to do is replace a couple of um, places in the template or um, credentials in the template and replace them with um, uh, a holder. And then you will replace these holders with the various credentials of the people you are actually going to attack. We'll see it in a second. So the placeholder, for example, here is the email, the email placeholder. And he's replacing it with the you know, placeholder. And now he's replacing the URL that the credentials will be sent to. And now he has a template for the attack. Notice he didn't know any code, he didn't write anything, just copy paste. This helps him set up uh, the website. He's doing it locally, but of course he can do it um, in a real server if he wishes to. 
but small technical details. Now he's importing the website that he wants to use with the custom template. And now he's adding the victims. And now he's creating a campaign. So an attack campaign, um, like maybe we want to run multiple campaigns because you're a pro fisher and um, you don't want all of them to be the same. Maybe you want to attack different companies at different times, different schedules, depending on the time of um, the day, um, depending on the regions, etc. So you can run multiple campaigns at the same time. Maybe you want to change different things like uh, environment parameters to make it difficult uh, for the defender to identify where it came from. And take a look what happened now. So now he has the campaign ready. He launched it. And now he has like the status of the campaign. Look at how nice the GUI is for that uh, phishing tool. And he can see an email was sent, like that's the attack. And here he just sent one email. But as you can see, he can just add here as many lists or CSVs as he wants of potential victims. And he can send it to all of them, the same campaign with one click. Um, and now let's see what it looks like from the other side. We're changing to the victim's point of view. We got a message. And it looks like there was a, a sign in attempt and Google blocked it. So of course we want to check the activity because we want to verify that nothing bad happened. And we reach a website which looks legitimate and Google asks us to sign in. It looks legitimate because we want to see um, what was blocked. But of course, this is the Fisher's website and by entering the credentials here, we're actually giving it away. And now we just lost our password. And it looks like everything went well, but in fact, um, the attacker just got our credentials and this is what it looks like, very organized. He clicked the link, when, from where, he has some information about us, um, and he has our password. And yeah, now our organization is breached, our personal information is breached, whatever. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? Um, not go be a hacker, it's really easy, but that being a hacker is very easy. Like creating massive campaigns is very easy. And as we will see in a second, the numbers of attacks is increasing rapidly every year uh, by the month actually. And it's very easy to understand why it's so easy, right? Uh, we don't have to learn how to code. We just need to know which software to download. And this is exactly why defending the cyberspace is so important um because it's just a very big problem um okay and just before this was like a head start just to give you some motivation as to why this is important but um i know we're going to talk about uh, ai and i'm going to give you try to give you some intuition about like machine learning and i just can't ignore uh, all of the generative models that are running uh, wild right now I'm sure you've heard of at least like DALI or uh, other generative models which are out there, Midjourney maybe. And these are examples. So everything here was generated by a computer. Uh, this is not a great song, but it's a song I generated with one click of a button. These images weren't, were never created by humans. They were generated by computers. And what I want you to think at this point is like, how can we, how can we use as defenders and as attackers this technology um, for either reason or a uh, way, and then we will discuss it. So yeah, just putting on the table that this is like uh, actual capabilities which are available to anyone. So what will the lecture look like? We're running through some uh, angles of attack, just giving you a very high level overview of um, what cyber attacks look like. Then we're going to focus on BC, which is business email, com business email compromise, uh, which is a specific type of attack or domain of attack. Then we're going to talk about traditional defense. Then we're going to talk about artificial intelligence used in offense and why it breaks the traditional defense. Um, then we're going to talk about how you can use AI to leverage defense. 
and um, what are models, mathematical models uh, for that. And uh, Lucid, which is um, our machine learning framework in Perception Point. Um, yeah, just checking if there are any questions so far. Yeah, so no questions. Uh, feel free to ask. Okay. Um, right, so angles of attack. Um, so as you know, like there are malicious softwares which can be sent. Um, there are zero days which are malicious or um, threats which aren't known yet and can be leveraged. Uh, you can attack a specific endpoint device, which is like a computer. Maybe you're attacking the network structure, maybe a server or a router or something like that. Maybe you are trying to make a person be um, uh, the weak link and give you something he shouldn't. And that's how you break into the uh, system. And of course, there are various evasion techniques which can be used to overcome a lot of defensive mechanisms. So all of these are like different types of attacks, but we are going to focus on specifically phishing, um, mostly in the textual um, domain. Um, right, so this is like an actual attack we found. Uh, it was anonymized, but take a look at it. There is no software here. Um, there is basically no computerized like a uh, threat here. Uh, the, the whole attack is just information, like just the text. Um, and what we see here is that someone is asking to get back to him and he's impersonating someone else, a real person. And he just hopes that you won't notice it's a different person and he will send him um, whatever he's asking for. Um, and on the right, we can see like the amounts of attacks. So as you can see there on the right, this is like one specific company that we're protecting. It's an actual, the numbers from an actual company. And um, this is just one, we, like this is what you see on every medium to large company, uh, unique attacks uh, per month. So as you can see, like a lot. Uh, so what is business email compromise? Uh, it's being compromised using email, <laughs> uh, using your business email. Uh, and there are many ways to attack. We see a huge variety of ways you can attack this way. And as you can notice, like as a defender, what will you look for? There is, there is no malicious software here. There is no malicious signature in the code or something like that you can look for. This is just like legitimate text. And the question I'm asking you or asking you to try and think about it is, how do you know that this is not like a legitimate question? Uh, so this person, hey, hope this finds you well. Uh, can you answer me by email, blah, blah, blah. And of course, this is like a prompt to start a conversation. And if this person will buy into it and think this is actually Mark Avery, maybe he will give him cru the attacker cru crucial information. And um, in this specific, this, this also was a little bit changed from the original, but the, the attack here was that um, the email address was changed. And I think like the original um, email address, the domain, this is not a, yeah, this is <laughs> not accurate. But um, let's say this S didn't exist. And originally the domain was the same, but without the S. And if you don't notice this slight change, maybe you're thinking you're talking to the Mark Avery you know so well. So this is one way uh, attackers leverage like internet protocols uh, just to um, make people think there's someone else like impersonate. All right, so how do you start a BC attack? First of all, you scrape the internet. What's scraping? Scraping is just downloading automatically uh, massive amounts of data. So for example, maybe you can build a tool or get an already made tool which will run for different big companies and just look on their websites for email addresses. And this is a very um, efficient way to get big data sets of uh, potential emails. And the more you have, like we said at the beginning, uh, the better the chances are that someone will fall for your scam. Uh, maybe you can buy data. 
Maybe you don't have to scrape the internet. Maybe you can just get someone who did it for you. Maybe you've already hacked someone and now you're inside the organization and you can get some internal information. For example, names of people. Maybe you can join a conversation that actually happens sometime, etc. Uh, cold email is just sending emails to a lot of people you don't know and hoping someone will fall for it. So numbers. And of course, uh, advanced automated frameworks, which will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, meaning maybe they can both scrape the internet and start conversations for you, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about traditional defense, like how um, traditionally we approach uh, this type of attack. And let's think about what um, an attack is made of. So like we saw at the beginning, traditional attacks start with creating a template and a template means that most of the structure of the um, message will stay the same so here you can see only the orange pieces are going to change to every different person but the black uh, wording will stay the same and the probability the two people will write exactly the same sentence uh, in the same way is very, very low, even if the um, sentence or phrase is relatively short. And what we would like to do is create a mechanism that says, hey, listen, this is this was a malicious attack. This is the structure. And every time this structure happens, just um, classify it as a malicious attack. Now, this works really, really well. It works surprisingly well. And why does it work so well? Because like we saw, most people use out-of-the-box tools and out-of-the-box tools use templates and then they just regenerate the same text. So this is actually kind of like um, a natural language uh, signature, which we can easily detect and use uh, to stop uh, attacks. Now let's think what it takes to create a whole new attack, like um, genuinely new that, let's say we already know this template, the next attack, we won't be able to catch it. So of course we need new content. So rewriting this sentence is a lot of work. It might be difficult um, and we might fall for it and keep a part of it the same. And then maybe uh, the defense mechanism will catch it again. So creating actual new content is very difficult if you want to do it in scale, like do it 10 times is fine. But if you want to send it to a million people, it's very difficult. And you need new offensive infrastructure. So we saw um, our researcher doing it earlier in the video. Uh, and as you saw, it took some time. So maybe you can find automated tools which will do it automatically, but it's not that easy to create a lot of new infrastructure which uh, changes dynamically all the time. And of course, you need to get new targets every time. So again, there are tools, but it's not that easy. Uh, so creating one campaign is easy, but creating campaigns which change dynamically is a much more challenging uh, task. And Let's talk about like the defensive um, mechanism used here. So I don't know if you thought about it, but there is one serious drawback of that mechanism, which is unless you've seen this attack, which I assumed you already know is malicious, you don't have this template. So until someone tells you, hey, listen, you missed this one, there is no way you can stop it. And this is, of course, like a major drawback of traditional defense, which is unless you have um, prior knowledge or cyber threat intelligence, which is very reliable, you have no chance to uh, manage uh, new attacks, which you haven't seen before. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look about um, artificial intelligence in the context of offense. So what we see here is um, a website. You can um, register online for it. It's by OpenAI, which are uh, a leading company in the artificial intelligence uh, space. And they give here a very simple tool. And what this tool does is you give it a textual input and give it instructions, and then it does your instructions. So in this example, hey, good morning, Jasmine. Your collection was not modified in the past year. Please update it to log into the system to keep it. Unchanged collections will be deleted. Use this link, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. So this is, of course, like um, a generic phishing template. 
one in 10,000 might fall for it. Um, and by itself, there's nothing new here. But take a look what happens when I give it the, the OpenAI um, infrastructure um, an instruction, which is a paraphrase. So it generated automatically this new sentence, which is good morning. Uh, please log into the system to keep your collection. Unchanged collections will be deleted. Use this link to update it, Microsoft Academy. Now look at these two sent like two phrases. They are different. The meaning is exactly the same. Uh, it used the same links, everything, but um, the words changed, the structure changed. Uh, I think most of you will agree. This is not the same template. Like if you knew what this template looks like, like replace this with name, replace this with link, replace this with name, this doesn't confer perfectly with this template. It's like different. The, everything which, was, which we saw earlier is black changed. Um, and of course you can understand why this is a problem because um, you can't use traditional defense against this type of mechanism. And so using this framework, I just press the button six more times and now I have six different, entirely different um, paraphrases of this phrase. Uh, and yeah, of course, this is a big problem. Why? Because now an attacker can use this API, for example, and generate the same meaning of the attack, but every time it's different. And this means that my traditional defense won't work anymore. Um, yeah, so this is a good time for questions if you have any. Okay, so I'll assume everything is very clear. All right, so now we've seen the problems that AI can create. We saw how easy it is um, to generate attacks, attack campaigns, and we saw how new technology can overcome traditional defense. And what I'm going to show you now and try to give you some intuition is how artificial intelligence can be used uh, to defend against these type of attacks um, and try to give some insight behind the scenes as to how it works. Uh, which is not an easy task. All right, so what we would like to do, instead of learning a template, we would prefer if we could generalize the problem. That means to adapt on the fly um, to what we're seeing. Um, and how we would do that, we would try to convert a problem to numbers. And the reason we would like to do that is because if we manage to do it, we can use math mathematical tools um, to identify these formats and signatures. If this is not 100% clear, don't worry. I'll explain in a second. And how can we do it? So consider you had a magic box, which you put words into the box and you get numbers. Uh, so for example, morning translates to 12, sunrise translates to 14, elephant to 145, etc. And what this magic box does, it doesn't just gives a random number to every word, but it tries to capture the meaning of the word. And then the output number is supposed to represent um, the meaning of the word in comparison to other words. So what does that mean? It means that morning is a word which is more that resembles or has a connection, a stronger connection to sunrise rather than to elephant. So the numbers that represent morning and sunrise should be closer mathematically, like the distance between 12 and 14 is two. And the distance between 12 and 145 is 145 is minus 12, which is 133. So, or yeah. So, um, how will this help us? This will help us because we no longer, if this works properly, we no longer really need to find a template. All we have to do is say, hey, listen, this is an attack and I'm going to save the number of that template or the number of that example. And if I see a very similar example to that, I don't care about the template. What I care about is the meaning. And if the meaning of both of these is very similar, then maybe the other one is malicious as well. So this is like a very, very um, high level intuition as to how uh, turning words into numbers 
uh, might work. And I'm going to show you both like how a system like this might work. Uh, but before that, how can we create this magic box? So this magic box is called word embeddings. Um, I think like the original technology was developed maybe a decade ago, uh, if you've ever heard of uh, word to vec And imagine that instead of a single number, I can represent every um, word or a sentence in a lot of numbers. And the lot of numbers in the list is also called a vector. And um, how can we find these magic numbers? So let's talk about words. Um, let's say I go through the whole Wikipedia, like the whole knowledge in Wikipedia. And every time I see two words next to each other, I bring their numbers closer. I start with maybe random numbers and I just bring them closer. And every and um, over time, what we would expect to see is that uh, words that are seen in the same context get closer to each other. Um, so consider uh, I drank coffee in the morning or I drank coffee at sunrise. These both make some sense, right? So maybe we'll see it them getting close to together after a while. But um, I drink coffee in elephant is a very unlikely sentence. And maybe I'm the first person ever to say it. So their numbers might be very distant from each other. So this is like, of course, it's a little bit more complex, but this is like a general intuition. And maybe this seems uh, unrelated, but we'll see in a second that it relates very strongly. Let's talk about models. models. So I'm not sure if you've heard the term models, like mathematical models before, uh, but what are models? So models are basically like this red circle you see on the screen. And I'll explain what it does. So this is like um, a simple graph. And every um, pass mark or X mark uh, represents, let's say, an email. And the green ones represent uh, legitimate emails. And the X marks represent um, malicious emails. And let's say that using our magic box, we wouldn't classify just the number, but we would try to classify how urgent is the content in that email. So on the right side of the graph, we would put uh, content which is very urgent. And on the left, we would put content which isn't urgent at all. And we would do exactly the same for the domain reputation, which means like how many attacks we've already seen before uh, from some domain, for example. Uh, so let's say, I don't know, apple.com, maybe we've never seen uh, attacks, so it will be very high. And I don't know, maybe some random site website, tiny website domain, we've only seen attacks from, so it will be very low. And we collect a lot of data, a lot of what's called label data that we know if it's bad or uh, good. And we put it all uh, on this graph. And what we can see with our eyes is that uh, domains with good reputation, uh, where the content isn't urgent at all, are grouped together and they are all clean. And very urgent content with, from websites that had very low reputation are always bad. Uh, so this is like simple logic. And what we would like to do, like the model, will be that this circle here, which circles all of the bad examples. Now, how do we use this circle? So let's say now we don't know these uh, samples anymore, but we remember the circle. Next time we get an email, if it falls in the area of the good reputation and low content urgency, meaning outside of the circle, uh, we might claim that it's legitimate. But if it falls inside a circle, we would claim that it's illegitimate because we've seen a lot of examples that when the content is urgent and the main reputation is low, then um, the content is malicious. Now, this is what a basic model looks like. It's just um, a line or a lot of lines in some space. And they just try to help you classify, uh, in this example, um, what's malicious and what's clean. I'm doing a simplification here. There are other, other types of models, but this is like a basic classifier model. 
And now we I'm going to try and give you like intuition as to how you can build such model. Uh, of course, the model that uh, we would like to build is a classifier of emails that classifies whether an email is clean or malicious. But unfortunately, this is a very difficult and complicated model to model. Uh, so instead, we're going to classify a sentence, whether it's hot or cold. Um, so we will see what it means in a second. So let's say I have a sentence, and the sentence can be a single word, could be multiple words. And there are so many options as to describe whether a sentence is hot or cold. So breezy, that sounds pretty cold to me. Very warm sounds pretty hot. Terribly hot is very, very, very hot. Not hot is actually cold, and cold is cold. So I'm sure you can think about many ways to describe a sentence as cold or hot. But what I'm trying to say is that although the amount of words is limited to the English vocabulary, the amount of sentences which you can create is basically infinite. And this is what makes our problem so complicated. So this is where we're starting to like uh, really feel the complexity of NLP. NLP is like um, natural language processing, which is like the domain where you try to analyze um, free speech or free text, free human text, and analyze it with computer software. So how can we approach this problem? So like we said, there are many options um, for sentences, but there aren't as many sentences, uh, there aren't as many words. So yeah, sorry, this is not a good example, but take for example, hot. Hot is just the word, not terribly hot, just hot. Hot is very high, warm, also pretty high, but not as high as hot. Um, breezy, pretty cold, cold, very cold, freezing, very, very, very cold, right? Um, all right, and what can we do with it? So let's say we have a sentence. Um, our model never saw the word very, so it has no idea what number to give it, but it has seen the word hot. So it gives it um, the score from earlier. And now let's say our model does an average of these numbers, and the average is 0 0.7 like a 0 0.5 plus 0 0.95, the average is around 0 0.7. And um, 0 0.7 is higher than half. So it's closer to hot than cold. So we would classify very hot as hot using this model. Um, so this is like very, very basic intuition as to how um, a model will work. Now, let's take it a step further. Uh, so of course the devil is in the details and like we saw if we take the example of very hot we did a successful classification and we said this sentence is very hot meaning it's hot but take this classification of not hot so what would the classifier do it will take a look at not and it never saw this word so it has no idea what it means and it will just give it a score of half but it has seen the word hot so it will give it a high score so the average will be exactly the same. It will be like a 0 0.7 or something. And that is a problem because it will think not hot is actually hot. So this is where our model fails. So do we give up? Of course not. It only means we need to um, address this not problem, right? So what do we need to do? So we saw earlier that we, to we took all of the um, cold and hot words and we put them on um, on a scale. And now what we're going to do is take um, the words which represent like amount and put them on a different scale, like a totally different scale, different space. And now we re represent every word with two numbers. The first number represents whether or not it's hot or, or cold, like these numbers. And the second number represents whether or not it's like the amount. So very is a very big amount and not is like the opposite of very. So it's like zero. And of course, our model don't know how to handle two numbers per word. So we have to modify the model. So the new model will look something like this. Uh, now this might look complex, but it's not that complicated. 
So this is the sentence we're trying to evaluate. Today is very hot. So today has no meaning, like we don't know this word on either of the scales. So it gets like half and half, which won't affect any average. The same goes for is. But very, we know it's a big amount. Hot, we know it's a big amount. But look at the first number, this high number for hotness and this high number for amount. And now what we can see is that instead of two um, nodes that we had early, earlier, had one node, now we have two nodes. One of them we can imagine takes care of the amount and the other one takes care of uh, hotness, for example. Uh, so this says the average of the sentence as in regard to um, hotness is high, and this means a lot, and the average, again, is very high, so we classify this uh, sentence as hot. Now, again, this is not a perfect model. You can pretty easily think about examples where it won't work, but what we can see here is that adding more complexity to the model allows us to address um, different tasks or understand more complex relations. Um, and what you see here is what's known as a fully connected network. It's a type of a neural network. Uh, of course, it doesn't work exactly this way. I've simplified a lot of things here, but this is uh, the basic um, idea. All right, and just to make things slightly more complicated, um, what happens when you have multiple models? So Consider this, consider you have the content urgency and domain reputation um, model that we've seen before. And this, let's say it's the yellow circle, but now we have other ways to classify emails as malicious or clean or sentences, hot or cold. And every model uses some different information and it uses um, maybe different sources or thinks about it slightly differently. And we think they're all pretty good. And um, what happens when they don't agree? So if they all agree on the same uh, sample, it's easy. We say like, yeah, it's malicious. Everybody thinks it's malicious. But what happens if it's only slightly malicious or it's malicious by one model, but it's not malicious by other two? So how do we make a call? So this is what we call an ensemble model. An ensemble model is a model, which is like a meta model which controls other models. And it learns um, how to uh, take into account multiple models and make a decision based on what they said. So it's like a model that controls other models. Now, Lucid is our framework, which holds a lot of different ensembles. And each ensemble is built to um, make a decision about the specific type of attack. Uh, you can think about every type of attack as a layer and every layer works by itself and they all work together so um, this is how we catch different types of attacks using a lot of models that work together now um, i want to give you some intuition as to numbers and like the accuracy and robustness of the models and why do we need so many models that will be so accurate so let's say i don't know you have like um, 100 million emails that you want to scan every, I don't know, day. Um, and you have a model and the model is accurate in 99.9% .9 of the times. So this might sound really, really good, like that a model is so accurate. It only makes mistakes every uh, 1,000 times. But if we see 100 million uh, emails per day, that would mean we make 100,000 mistakes every day, even if it's like 0.1% um, uh, false negative um, percentage. So yeah, this is like, these are terrifying numbers. So how do you counter that? Well, you counter it exactly using multiple layers. So if you have one layer, which is 99.9%, um, it's not good enough. But you have, if you have another one, and it doesn't rely on the first layer. It does uh, a different logic, which is independent or mostly independent. Then what you get is that uh, the 100,000 which passed uh, wrongly go through another layer, which um, has the same statistics and 
it will probably catch most of these. And the more layers you have, the more robustness you get. Um, so this is how we manage uh, scale and huge amounts uh, of data to reduce our, our like, false negative, false positive um, counts. Um, all right, I see a few questions. So let me just uh, address this um, slide and I'll get, get back to you guys. All right, so um, what we see here is a specific attack. Um, again, an invoice, someone is re referring to an actual uh, email. And this is, um, this was actually, I think, took from an actual, like someone imitated an actual email or something. And they, there is no template which looks exactly like this, but this was caught by an artificial intelligence model, defense model, uh, that uh, noticed that although these sentences haven't seen before in exactly this way, their sentiment or like their essence has been seen before in many malicious attacks. And therefore this uh, is also a very um, big suspect. Of course, as you can see, there are a lot of other um, layers which raised evidences that this is an actual attack. Uh, this is what it looks like in the layers. And um, yeah, this is just an example for an attack that was blocked using um, our models. Right, so let's get back to you guys. Uh, feel free to add as many questions as you like. This is a great time. Um, okay, uh, so I get one asked question. How can we be sure that these software do not embed threats when downloaded? Um, not sure what type of... Um, so I, I think um, that's referring to the initial um, the initial video that you were showing. Oh, oh, you can't. This is like the initial video I showed is uh, how to attack. And I would not uh, consider attackers or like people who build attack tools to be reliable. And I would not recommend downloading them. Yeah, this is my, <laughs> this is my take on it. Uh, these are, yeah, they're attack sufferers. They really might be spooked. Um, so are you seeing AI uh, campaigns in the wild? Uh, also, excellent question. Um, we see some, like it's very difficult to know if uh, a campaign, how a campaign was made. Uh, maybe it's a very complicated template, which we didn't understand is a template. And it's very hard to cluster, like um, get together a lot of different um, attacks and say, yeah, these, were made by the same generator. Um, so it's much more difficult than grouping templates. Um, I think we've seen some. Of course, it's not as uh, rampant as like uh, template campaigns, but I'm pretty sure we've seen some. Um, what we do see, we, what we do see is um, that even when the same person generates a lot of attacks, like manually, you might use like the same sentences or try to use the same techniques and then like the models will catch them. So it's not AI campaigns, but it's like sort of similar maybe. Um, right, how does PP determine reputation of domains and senders? Um, so there are multiple ways. Uh, reputation is like a, a whole topic by itself, but I'll give you like the most basic uh, reputation um, technique, simply count for each domain, how many attacks and like how many malicious versus clean um, content you've seen from these domains. And then you can just say like, yeah, I've seen a hundred uh, attacks from that domain and only 50 clean ones. So maybe I should take a better look at these clean ones because the reputation is very low. Um, all right. Uh, another question here is, how often do you test new models uh, within the platform? Uh, constantly. So the R&D team constantly works on new models. Um, it's slightly more complicated because what we do is we don't only train entirely new models. We both 
um, run a life cycle for the existing models, which means uh, we keep training them and they keep learning from um, new examples all the time. But other than that, we try different models all the time. Uh, we use state of the art models. Uh, we add, we fine tune them with uh, proprietary data we have here to make them better and more specific to our needs. Um, so the next question is, after showing the progress of AI offense and the corresponding defense techniques, what do you predict will be the next step of AI offense? Um, cool question. So I think like we might see two types of attacks. Um, one attack, which is pretty interesting, would be like an artificial intelligence model, which runs the automated framework. So it won't change just the text, but maybe it will change the whole framework to make it um, more competent. And I think the other one is um, models that will try to learn how the specific defense mechanism works, like to learn from its mistakes and we'll try to adapt over time. So maybe something like this, like an adaptive attack system. I don't think, like it's very difficult to know if there are some things like that, but I don't think we've seen anything like it. Uh, yeah, we have another questions. Uh, do, do the models that analyze links have an easier time validating it, which might even be easier than reading the words? Yeah, so um, analyzing links. This is like also an entire like domain of expertise. And of course, uh, we do it. Um, so very, very high level uh, speaking here. There are two ways um, to validate links. One way to validate a link is what we call static scanning, meaning just by looking at the link, what can you tell? Um, now, the reason this might be an interesting approach is because um, it's very short, like it's just the actual URL, like the link. And maybe you can gather a lot of information about different domains and the structure of different URLs. Maybe you can use cyber threat intelligence, etc. So this will be very, um, uh, like a very efficient approach. Um, and it works extremely well a lot of the times. But again, it will rarely work against like um, first time seen attacks or like um, fresh campaigns. And this is why we have another type of scanning, which is called dynamic scanning. And dynamic scanning means to actually browse to the website and see what's going on in there. Uh, because when you see the actual website, you might realize like what's the intention of the person who sent that link. Um, and dynamic scanning is much more complicated because you have to imitate the person who is browsing and you have to somehow understand whether or not um, the content in the website is legitimate or not. So this is a very complicated domain uh, and there are a lot of ways to like explain it, but it's like, a, it's a great subject for a different uh, webinar. <laughs> so maybe next time. So speaking of other webinars, um, I want to thank everyone for who joined us and who participated. I also want to give a massive thank you to Ali for this presentation um, and our audience for their time and attention. I want to extend this opportunity to invite you all to our next webinar, which is going to happen with Osterman Research, in which we will discuss the changing threat landscape for email, web, and cloud apps, and what organizations must do to bolster security protections for these channels. We're offering this webinar on two different dates to account for all time zones. Join us either on January 24th or on January 31st. Have a great rest of your day and happy holidays and see you next time.